This short video tutorial on Sequence Generator Pro is going to take another look at focusing. So one of the things that we need to understand is how the focus algorithm works. And the way this works compared to other focus algorithms is it takes the star size of a number of stars rather than a single star to calculate a mean half-flux radius and it uses that to compute the best focus position by minimizing the half-flux radius. Other algorithms use a single star, typically a bright one, and then take a very brief exposure of it and try and do it from that. The danger with taking a very brief exposure of a star is that you'll, you may be affected by seeing noise in that from one image to the next, the star size can vary quite dramatically because of seeing noise and not because of focus. Whereas the longer focus times that we typically use somewhere in the region of 5 to 10 seconds for an autofocus run means that if there is any seeing noise it averages out and still creates a round blur but the blur is similar for all of the stars at all the focus positions so you still can see a trend. So without further ado let's look at the focus settings and these appear in two areas. There's one here which has manual focus controls and it has the autofocus settings here and there's one in the control panel under focus. Now again you have the manual controls here as well. You also have focus reminders and autofocus trigger points. You can also reverse the direction. You can also do temperature adjustment. Once you've characterized a focuser you can automatically move the, the focus tube according to the ambient temperature. Personally I don't like that because with a large telescope it tends to cool down at a different rate to the ambient conditions and so therefore the outside temperature isn't necessarily an accurate uh, setting for the transient period for the telescope to catch up. And this is particularly true around twilight when the telescope is cooling down rapidly. You can also do various other things like set the auto adjust focus per filter. What that means is that if you've already predefined your focus positions for each filter in relation to each other, so if you know that one filter needs 10 more steps outward than another filter, you can set that up in the filters tab and what this will do is every time you change filter position rather than rerun the autofocus routine it'll simply just move it by the, the number of steps required. So this is a colour camera at the moment, it does have a filter wheel but at the present time I'm actually focusing with each filter separately because they're all clear filters and don't need extended um, autofocus exposure times. Typically if I'm using narrowband filters because they're exposure times are much longer. I will typically use a referential exposure with a clear filter and then move a prerequisite number of steps for the narrowband filter to be in focus. So a couple of other little things along here in that if you hit the, the, the settings button which is identical to this one here, it brings up on the left hand side all the triggers and on the right hand side how the autofocus is run. So for instance you can choose to focus every number of frames or after a certain amount of temperature change or after a certain period of time and typically what I do is I have a combination so I will do a temperature change but sometimes I will for instance say guarantee that I get one autofocus run every 30 minutes which means that if I do get a bad focus result it doesn't ruin the whole night if I'm using longer exposures around 20 minutes I might extend this a bit more or alternatively if I'm doing narrowband I might for instance say every three narrowband frames I'll um, redo the focus no matter what. And these work in tandem so if an, a temperature trigger triggers an autofocus run then it resets this counter so it doesn't necessarily do too many autofocus runs. Down the bottom here are some specific settings for, which are optimized for different telescopes. If you have a moving mirror I would recommend you do this one because it will refocus um, your system after the, the telescope is slewed around a bit and also it's not a bad idea to do autofocus on resume just in case something's moved when you've parked the mount and, and taken it back out and park and all the rest of it. So on the right hand side we have the, the way that the autofocus is run, so you have the binning of the camera, you have a, a default exposure time for one-shot colour cameras, and 
Also in the filter tab on the control panel, you can de define the exposure time for each filter for autofocus. You have the number of steps and the step size. I typically use either seven, nine or 11 steps. I'm at the moment in the middle on nine. An odd number of steps means one's in the middle, which is handy. The autofocus cl closeout delay is just simply how long the display sits on the screen before it closes itself out. And this one here is to prevent SGP confusing a hot pixel for a star. So typically at a one by one binning level, I might choose three pixels because if a hot pixel is three pixels wide, then I've, I've got a problem. The other couple of things here, if you've got a central obstruction, I would suggest you disable smart focus. What that does is it extends the focus um, outwards, which isn't always a great idea if you've got a centrally obstructed scope because the star shape changes from being a blob to being a donut. And estimating the diameter of a donut is harder than a blob. And so you can get some inaccuracies. Again, if you're going to autofocus with just one filter and then reference that filter to all the other positions, you would click on this and then choose the filter you're using. And to avoid trying to set up your autofocus, on poor star shapes around the corner of your image, you can crop your frames in uh, by 20% in this case. And if you have poor signal to noise ratio on your camera, then you can apply dark subtraction here by creating your own dark library. So I think I missed one on this one side, which is autofocus on filter change. Because I'm not doing referential changes in the focuser between filters, I would need to click on this one so that if I do change the filter, it will trigger an autofocus run. So without further ado, let's shut that down, clear that off and hit run. And what we want to do is just see what a typical focuser run should look like. So I'm going to come back in a few minutes when it's almost complete. So it's just completing the last exposure in the run and with this new version of SGP it's done a quadratic fit to the best position and you can see that it has drawn a green line through most of the points that approximate the curve that it expects. Um, in the past SGP in common with others used a V profile so it tried to create a straight line extrapolation through here and through here and join in the middle. Now, one thing to watch out for, especially with centrally obstructed scopes, if you start getting what we call dog ears at the end here, that's an indicator that you're going too far off focus and potentially you're seeing donuts and the donuts are messing up the calculation of the star size. So my step size and the number of steps is probably on the, the upper limit and probably what I'll do is reduce that 50 setting down to 40 and that'll give me a good range which means I'll capture the focus even if it drifts between um, autofocus runs and it'll give me a good uh, set uh, you know I don't want the curve to be too shallow because otherwise this calculation of this curve it's more influenced by just one or two bad samples whereas these strong sidewalls are actually quite useful for getting the right focus position and the reason it's not smooth in every case is because of seeing noise especially with central obstructed scopes because they give some very strange patterns uh, when they're slightly off focus and it's probably an indicator too that this um, Ritchie Cretton telescope isn't precisely collimated because the star shape past and before focus is a slightly different shape and it is an indicator of collimation error and it also gives the software a different value. So if I just close that for a second because I manually did the autofocus run, this doesn't automatically close. And then I'm going to go into my settings and probably reduce that down to 40. I would avoid making this value too small as the curve becomes very shallow and the quadratic fit is more sensitive to a rogue sample. And one thing I forgot to do was because I have a centrally obstructed scope, I should have actually had the smart focus disabled because I don't really want it going ramping off, which is why in my case, I always get rough focus before I start a sequence. And if certainly if the temperature is changing greatly between the, the end of the night and the beginning of the night, then I'll just quickly check the focus position before I run the sequence. Another thought 
to make sure that your focus doesn't drift off too far before an event starts, which is simply to set up a dummy sequence. So I create a new target and move it to the top and I just call it focusing. I do not want to move to location, it doesn't really matter where it is. And all I'll do is just take a light frame, maybe something like uh, 20 minutes, and just carry on doing that, and then make the start time of this and the end time of this work together. So for instance, if my start time for this is 20 hundred hours, then I'll make the end time for this 20 hundred hours, just one minute beforehand. So this will do focusing runs and then it will move on to this and then it will carry on with the target but it will be in focus. And these images of, of this um, target will just be discarded. But it's one way of keeping track of focus if your, your target doesn't rise until later on in the night and it gets very cold very quickly. So that's just another little thought about focusing. So thank you for watching and with the remaining clear sky tonight I'm going to try and finish off another video which is looking at guiding with PhD2.